Welcome to Skunk Works, where each episode we speak with CEOs of established SaaS companies about strategies for keeping innovation fresh. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric. I'm the host of the Skunk Works podcast, where we trade innovation stories with experienced business leaders. Before I begin, this episode is brought to you by Half Serious. It's an innovation as a service company that I founded, where we work with leadership teams who want to accelerate software as a service projects. My guest today is Chad. Hello, Chad. Thank hey, you for being thanks here. for having me. All right. And I'm so excited to talk to you, about, to you today because you seem to be um, a fairly bit more advanced than I am in something that I've been trying to um, uh, to get really good at in the past years and never been really successful. So this is going to be like a private masterclass uh, that I'm sort of uh, get, getting myself into. Uh, so you're the founder or the co-founder of a service business. You've been doing this for over 18 years. Most f- uh, C- uh, founders of service companies that I know that have been doing this for a long time have tried their hand at developing products on the site. I know that I have. I've done it twice. I've never been successful at it. And my conclusion is that I failed for three reasons. The first one is very difficult to dedicate the amount of attention that the product needs or or that separate company needs in order to be successful. Then uh, money. um, And and by that, I don't mean funding the project, but more like um, the, the business model of a service company is basically if I assign three engineers to a project, I know exactly how much Revenues I'm going to generate from that, how much margin is very safe, is a very understandable way of, of investing uh, money versus a product that always has so much more uncertainty in such a long period of time before it actually starts generating revenue. And then the third one is, is the is sort of go-to-market strategy. Like mm-hmm. I understand how to sell a service business. I don't really understand how to sell a product that much. Uh, I'm sure that it's more than Google and uh, Facebook ads, but that's probably you know what I understand of it. So mm-hmm. start talking at this point. I'm gonna let you start talking. Maybe it'd be useful to for you to talk a little bit about your current business, the uh, you know the service business, and then whatever you can tell us about the uh, the three aspects I just mentioned, which is attention, money, and go to market. Yeah, you're uh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and what I've learned, I've learned to be honest through failure. Uh, it took us uh, a few different tries to find something that would work for us. Um, and so, you know, I can give an overview of who we are and what we do by by talking about that that failure and that growth we've had over the years. So, sure. um, I'm founder of Thoughtbot. We're a web and mobile design and development company. We work with companies of all different sizes and stages, helping them go from a new idea to a launch product or improving an existing product. And over the way, along the way, in our last 18 years, we've worked on so many different products that we ourselves not only want to create products, but we see a need. So we you know, oh, we have this problem on three of the different applications that we're, we're doing. Um, maybe we can extract a service or a product out of that. And uh, we start to do that in our spare time or, or in the, um, you know, the extra time that we have in between client projects. And it's really easy, actually, for a company like ours, at least I found it, to go from that early concept stage to feeling like you you have something that could be worth investing in because we're good at building and writing software and designing apps that's what we know how to do so you know and we're also good great at identifying what the minimum viable product might be like the smallest possible thing that we can build and you get to that stage and um, then the reality of what it takes to build, launch, and run a successful business, you run smack into that. And the, those are those three reasons that you just um, talked about. So how have we, um, over the years, navigated that? Um, so I talked to a lot of founders of agencies and people who run agencies. and the there's a spectrum, but a lot of them want to do 
products. <laughs> yep. Some people actually start out a group, small group of co-founders and their actual goal is to generate pro- to create products and they say well we're going to get uh we're going to do some consulting in the meantime to make ends meet right i, I know a lot of startups like that so there might mm-hmm. be three to five guys and and they're like they have this idea but they need to you know pay the rent so in the meanwhile they're going to take on some some contracts right. just to be able to pay the bills and then so many of those people that I've talked to end up on what I call the treadmill of consulting, which is you have to keep on running in order to keep your business consulting business going in order to put food on your table and to um, and to if you start hiring employees to 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 make sure that they stick around and have enough work and that you can afford them. And you end up Consulting businesses are really hard to run profitably at small numbers because you have a lot of overhead. You've got to keep things going. So you say, and you never have time to work on the products that you wanted to do. So you say, okay, we need to be a little bit bigger in order to have enough. It's totally reasonable uh, (laughs) conclusion. If we were a little bit bigger, we would have more people, a little bit more bandwidth in order to work on our products. Right. So you say, if I'm going to be spending 10% of my attention mm-hmm. or, or my resources on the new product, and if I'm a hundred percent, a hundred people company, that's 10 people. But if I'm a 10 person, it's one person. Right. 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 So you hire that one person, you say, right. okay, you know, let, let's hire somebody that'll free up my bandwidth, or we could have them work on this product that we, you know, have maybe even built the early stages of, and, and we want to take it to the next level. And the reason why I call it a treadmill is because you got to keep on running. <laughs> Otherwise, you, 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 you can't afford the people that you've hired. And so you then need to take on more consulting clients in order to cover the costs that you are incurring. And you never end up getting the bandwidth that you hoped to get in order to work on the product. Got it. And so for those people, you know, the... There's a, there's a few different things, but the first is to have a hard look at what business you actually want to be in and realize that building product businesses is very different than consulting. The investment that you need, the margins that they have, the way that they generate revenue, and the skills that you need around a successful product as opposed to a service business in design and development are actually completely different. And building one organization that can do both of those things really well, you might be able to do it, but <clears throat> it's going to be really hard. <laughs> yeah. um, and so you're going to, if you try to do both equally, especially if your heart's not really in, to, in one, you really end up in a position where maybe you're not happy in your business after a few years. I talked to a lot of founders of agencies who end up in that, um, in that, at that point, the other, um, way to go about it is to, um, say, okay, these are very different businesses and I need to start being smarter about how I spend our time, the experience that I build and what our end goal is. And this is where it brings us to sort of the start, which is the, at ThoughtBot, we have built several products over the years. We, we have built and launched about seven different products. Some of them are sort of what I would call consumer-based businesses. So SaaS startups that are for a more general audience, apps, social apps, weather apps, that kind of thing. And all of those have been much harder to grow and build than building a product for ourselves as designers and developers that other designers and developers will use. Wait, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, mm-hmm. I think I understand. So you, you built some stuff that you sort of release in the universe that is sort of direct consumer or B2C type of stuff, a, a weather app that's free to download or whatever mm-hmm. that maybe pays mm-hmm. for itself with ads and right. scaling that versus scaling a product that's a more of a B2B product that you're going to sell to professionals. 
going one step further, actually, to other designers and developers. Got it. So our audience, the people that we regularly communicate with and 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 talk to, um, we have a blog where we post engineering articles and design articles. The readers of that blog are designers and developers. So when we had an idea for a performance monitoring service, we could create that for ourselves. It was something that we were going to use in our client work. And it was also something that was immediately valuable and of interest to the people who are already watching what we did and reading our blog and do, do the, those kinds of things. So we weren't oh, splitting our focus and attention or between, you know, hey, we're build it, we're a design and development company, and we're also building a weather app, which is a completely different audience and is going to take different marketing and and different skill set to really build a significant gotcha. So you're so you're you're building a product that is sort of scratching your own itch. You're mm-hmm. solving problems for your company. And what is sort of crazy and novel about what you just said is is you're almost creating products for your competitors, right? Like these yeah. other these other service companies are your competitors. I understand you're on some level you're like two ants lost in a uh, in a huge swimming pool and you're probably just never going to touch each other. So it doesn't matter. But right. it's interesting to say, hey, I'm going to all these other agencies. Let's say I'll give you an example. So at Half Serious, we have a pretty good boilerplate for launching new products into um, AWS. So we think mm-hmm. it's like a legacy product from from a company that exists that is sort of ha- has a lot of a big uh, infrastructure debt, and they want to move to something more modern. Yeah, we've, we've developed a I'm going to call it a kit or whatever to to make that transition really easily, and it sort of helps us with our costs and with a look, promise to get it done fast and, and reliably and secure and stuff like that. But it could be interesting to say, instead of trying to use that to go after the market, I should try to license that out possibly to companies in my industry that right. would benefit from this kit. I never thought right. of that. That's and the, the other reason, which I, I sort of glossed over, but I want to go back to is that we have this tension in our time, right? You you alluded to it too, is that you're continually pulled back to the consulting work because you will make revenue when you have people work on that. But when you make a product that people are buying, but also you are using in your business, right. some of that tension goes away because you can you are using it on your client work. <laughs> and so maintaining it and growing it and having the time for it becomes so much easier. I see. That's really interesting. I, I um, not too long ago I had a guest whose name is uh, whose first name is Hat, and actually is the acronym for a name because his name is ten kilometers long. And uh, <clears throat> and what he does is he has a service company that does you know software for the movie industry, and he's developed mm-hmm. products for that. And they're so you know, tightly knit to, to, right. to, to do these things. Like they, they, they attract problems that are so adjacent to one another that mm-hmm. he didn't feel like it was taking his attention off of things because you're, all your other apps. So, so the, the times I've done it internally too, I've spun up new companies every time I did it because the vision and even I would say the, the inherent values of what the thing right. we're trying to create are so different that it would be, uh, it would just wouldn't make sense to be, to reside within half serious. That's crazy. All right. So, right. so we talked about attention. So that to me is, is the solution right. to attention, right? Mm-hmm. And then let's talk about money. Um, how do you resolve that? The, the fact that you you now have a couple of people that are working on something that's not contributing to the bottom line. Well, one is to reduce some of that tension because they are contributing to the bottom line if they're also using it on client work. Got it. Um, so like take your AWS example. If, if you're using that on your client projects and you're making it better in the course of doing it, and then you're also offering it as a product, it reduces some of, some of that tension. I got it. And then, the, and then your go-to-market, how do, you, how do you attract the attention? It's through your blog, you said? Yeah, through our blog and our podcasts and those kind of things. That looking at the existing audience that we already have and how we can best speak to them, it's other designers and developers. And so when we go and build a dog walking app, no one, we don't have anybody to automatically talk to about that. 
Right. Uh, we've got to build a whole nother market. We have to have a whole nother go to market strategy. If instead we build an app for designers and developers, they're already listening to us. That is our built in go to market. And then the other thing which I mentioned earlier is changing the goalposts. So for us, the goalpost, and for a lot of companies, the goalpost of what we were aiming for might have been to either stop doing consulting one day or to have something very, very successful at, the, at, at least, like to build significant new businesses. And after several runs at that, um, getting things to a certain point and then realizing that what was going to take them to the ne next level would outpace what we could afford to invest in the product, but that would also get bring them to the, or they were at the point where the people that they needed, salespeople, marketing people, were people that we didn't have. And so not only would hiring them be successful, but they weren't necessarily skill sets that we had because we didn't need them for our other right. business. And so that's when we started to look at what are the other options? Can we move the goalpost? And this speaks to your money as well. When, when if, if we can shorten the cycle to having some sort of exit or return from this to be a shorter time frame, that can make it more worth our while in the short term. And so that's ultimately what we've done several different times, um, which is bring a product to a certain point where it starts to become too cumbersome for us to run within the company itself. That'll be, depending on the product, it can be different, but it'll for, for several of them, it's been about $250,000 in annual recurring revenue. And what I've learned is at about that size, there are actually a significant number of buy buyers out in the market who either are looking for their first product that has shown that it has traction to take it over and take it to the next level. And there's also a significant uh, number of buyers who their whole product suite, they, they've just, they, they have sort of 10 products, each generating $250,000 in annual revenue that they are a developer or a business person with a small development team. And they maintain that portfolio of products and they're looking to bring new products into their portfolio. Right. And so, so we've taken that there's, there's things a... to that point and then sold them to people who will either continue to run them or maintain them and take in our win essentially, you know, earlier on in the process, recognizing that we're very good as a design and development company, as people who can build products quickly at building products quickly, bringing them to market to an audience that is ready to buy, but we're not necessarily the right people to take things beyond that. Got it. So your playbook, I don't know if you call it this way, but let's yeah. call it that for now. Your playbook is basically to be able to take that product, get it to a place where it's not a product. It's a, it's a proto company at this point, if it's making 250,000 of, of ARR. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that point, that becomes interesting. But how do you how do you get buyers' attention? Like, what's your? How, you, you're saying that there's a market, but how do you signal to that market that there's something there for for them to to look at? Um, so we've done it a couple different ways. The most I would say the the easiest, and it was fairly successful, was to use a broker. That there are um, people out there who serve as brokers for buying SaaS businesses. So you go to them, they help you create a listing. They have a portfolio of clients who have purchased from them before, particularly those ones who are building portfolios of their own. And they bring the business to market for you and shop it around for you. And they negotiate. They're like a, you know, a real estate broker. Um, Got it. They say that they're negotiating on your behalf, but really they're trying to make a deal happen. Yeah. Uh, and and it's ve actually very similar to 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 that where you know offers get made and they're brokering the offers and and then when um, a sale is ready to happen they take care of escrow and and all of that stuff. 
That is and fascinating. I, yep. And I'm I don't want to just say it needs yep. to be $250,000. We also sold a product that was about $60,000 a year in annual revenue. Um, in that case, we had actually two products that were fairly closely aligned. And so we had one buyer buy both of them. Okay. And and do you need to sell the whole company or do you would you like to re, you know remain as the sort of technical partner or whatever or is that a complete cutoff? Most of the buyers that I've talked to and the things that we've done, every single one, we have sold the product, all its intellectual property, all its you know setup, um, and they have wanted to take over all design and development of the product. They have a team. They are expecting to either it's you know someone who's had a pretty successful development career wants to take over a product of their own, or they're that company that has built a portfolio. So they have the built-in team that's going to take it over. And so from our perspective, even though it's a little difficult to see your baby leave the door and to someone take it over, it's really worked really well for us to go back to what our core business is and look ahead to the next product and say, ah, now we've got a proven track record here. What's on the horizon for our next, next idea? I got you. Are we leaving money on the table by not investing in significantly getting those products to the next stage? Um, Maybe. But in that same period of time, we've also more than quadrupled the size of our consulting business. And it was sort of realizing, and I I literally said this to my co-founders, we already have a very successful business. Why do we keep trying to create another one? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> yeah. we should take a portion of that energy and rededicate it to our most successful business. I, I know my reason for that. I think, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm more of a uh, creative guy. Um, mm-hmm. And at some point, I think my personal problem is that at some point I get tired of not being able to call it all the shots on something. Yeah. And that just becomes, I, I, you know, I love working with my clients. They have amazing ideas, but sometimes I wish it was this way. They wanted Mm -hmm. this other way. And I'm like, you know, you're paying the bills. You're going to, you have the ultimate choice, but I get left with this soul of frustration. And by creating products for myself, I get to sort of let that energy out. It's, it's like a creative outlet. Yeah. Yeah. And I think early stages of products and getting them uh, their first customer base and then seeing them exit scratches that itch too. Um, And in fact, maybe even scratches it more because we've worked on a few products. We've built a few products of our own where we tried to run them ourselves. And what you saw, you see it in the numbers, but you you also see it in morale, (laughs) which is the graph of both numbers and morale goes like up, up, up right away. And then it levels off at some point. And we invest a lot of time and energy and sweat into trying to keep the product growing and it levels off because we don't have the we don't necessarily have the skill set or the the reach to be able to grow a product beyond sort of where we can take it organically and so people get disillusioned um, and and tired of working on that so at that point it was better for us to say actually let's you know move on from this and and T- you know, materialize, take another crack thing. And then right. you know, I get it. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, some people are, are like people that like to scale things and some people mm-hmm. are like, like creating things. So I, I, I understand. Yeah. And I think that that's a good way to sort of sum up my overall philosophy now, which is realizing what you're good at, what you want to spend your time on and embracing those strengths, realizing what business you have, just being intentional about right. things um, rather than, you know, n- not understanding who you are and what you do and what your strengths are and investing a lot in areas where it's very, it's a lot harder to be successful. Right. Have you ever had the uh, somewhat opposite um, situation of a service business 
that comes to you and they want a product develop and then they want you to come in as a partner just because they they themselves don't have the technical background to be able to handle that stuff but they can handle the sort of market stuff but not the product stuff you know i don't think we've really had that um situation but i think that that's part of the value the reason why is probably part of the way that we pitch ourselves and the value proposition that we put out there. We are very much of the mindset and we communicate with our customers and our potential customers that our goal is to make their business successful. Mm -hmm. And so we actually do a lot of training and hiring for them. So if we are working with a founding team or a business that doesn't have a tech team, people hire us because they know along the way of working together, we're going to help them hire people to replace us. Um, it's part of what we do. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't hit it too much is because people are expecting that it's going to go a certain way when they work with us. So the reason I was asking that is that I, I've done it twice this year, and I think it's interesting. I've mm-hmm. had a, um, a company that does influencer management that they needed a better product to handle contracts and payments, and a company that does online um, auctions, and they wanted to have like a more gamified, whatever um, version of, of what they did. And in both cases, I got really, I'm a product guy, you know, so I, I get mm-hmm. passionate about it and, and they, I think they can feel it. And then they're like, well, you know, we, we could go out and hire a team and stuff like that, but we're going to need to manage a team of technical people. I've, we've never heard the word agile before you mentioned it. And so there's no way that they can hope to be very successful at that. And so they're like, would you except to come in at a, and, and at that point, valuation is, is very low. Mm-hmm. And usually the, it ends up with a deal with a, like a convertible note or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then we, we come in as a partner at around 20%. And I've done it twice this year. And I thought it was kind of interesting because I get to focus on the product and I get to not worry about how it goes to market. And then on the flip side, they get to focus on how it goes to market. They don't need to think about the product. And so, it, right. but it's an experiment. I still kind of don't know how that's going to pan out, but I, I liked it. So I was wondering if uh, that's something. That so I, I ThoughtBot has not personally done that, but I, uh, but I know a few people, another, other consulting companies, design and development that have, and ultimately they've had success in that. But I think the, the, the way to think about that, if I could channel them a little bit is that they do it as investors and like investors, not everything wins. So if that's part of your strategy or your model, doing onesie twosies, you 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 have to expect it's really going to be hit or miss. Right. And if it's part of your business, if you want to build something successful, you've got to do, you know, 10 to get that one that yeah. that pays yeah, yeah, off. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Very cool. All right. You're giving me a lot of things to think about. This is this is a great start to the to the uh, to the new year. Can you give me an example of one of these products? You mentioned something about uh, designers or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. go to the specifics of one one of these things. Yeah, the the first thing, the first significant product that we ever created is a product called Airbrake. Now, it was originally called Hoptoad when we unlo- we when we launched it, and Airbrake is an exception catching service for web and mobile applications. Um, It was actually the first one in the market. So now there are a lot of them. It's either features of um, performance monitoring applications like New Relic um, has the feature of catching exceptions from your application and, and logging them together, grouping them together so that you don't get a lot of noise. It's all grouped together and you can see what exceptions have happened in our application. You can solve them. Um, or they're standalone products like Airbrake, um, Honey Badger. Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of them now. Um, and we created um, Hoptoad. Uh, it ran into some copyright stuff, so we had to rename it Airbrake. Um, and then we sold that um, after running it for a few years and growing it um, to uh, someone who was building a portfolio of cloud-based SaaS products for developers. Um, they ended up significantly growing Airbrake alongside of that suite of things and then selling them all to Rackspace for ah. a pretty significant amount 
of money, but okay. they, he also invested a lot <laughs> in order to build a team around them and to build, you know, to, and, you know, to be honest, he was willing to do things as not the original people who built the product that we were just not willing to do. We weren't willing. We made the mistake early on of launching very inexpensive plans. And we, uh, you know, we grandfathered all those original users in to those original plan levels, even though the cost of running the service was actually significantly higher than we anticipated because the nature of an exception catching service is you're essentially whenever anyone's having a problem, you're get you're getting the problem too. And so it's very high traffic. Yeah. Um, the way we described it is we were essentially under a constant DDoS attack because, <laughs> um, and so he was willing as someone taking over the product with the goal of growing it significantly to raise prices on existing customers. Right. And we knew that it was necessary, but he didn't want to, but do we it. Would, but we didn't want to do it. And so it was easier for us to, among other things, take the exit and hand the product over to someone that we were confident was going to do what was necessary when we, when we weren't ready to okay. do it. Are, they, are these deals, uh, do they have any sort of long tail or is it a one shot deal or is there an earn out? We've done everyone as a one shot okay. deal. And again, you sort of probably leave a little bit of money on the table for that, but you're reducing your risk significantly. Yeah, and it's also I'm I'm really sensitive to like the amount of threads that are running in my mind mm -hmm. all the time, and this just yes. like just closes a topic, and that's right. it, and that's worth something. Right. Not, not everything is about the right. money that you're uh, leaving on the table. Right. Hey, after the show, I would love to get contacts with some of those brokers. Love to talk to them about the yeah. project. Yeah. Amazing. So one very tactical tactical piece of advice that talking about Airbrake made me uh, remember is that copyright issue that we had. So um, you, you mean you know, with regards to naming or intellectual with na property? With naming. naming. And so, you know, I, I, so with Hoptoad, we built, we, we, it was our first significant product. So we, we, we created it for ourselves. We launched it entirely within our entity. Um, and we named it what we wanted to name it. And, and, um, with a, with a little bit of research to make sure there wasn't a product out there with the exact same name and, and all that stuff and things for the first year or so I forget the exact timeline went by but then we got a cease and desist and it said like um, our product is named Toad it's in the developer space um, we are telling you to stop using the name and um, you know our initial reaction was like to fight it or this wasn't fair or whatever. But we talked to our attorney and they're like, you know, you can fight this, but they're a lot bigger than you They're, you know? Um, so after talking with our attorney, we decided the best thing to do was to come up with a new name and do it. And I got very demoralized at the time because I felt like, Oh, we're going to do other products and copyrights are expensive and doing due diligence. It's, you know, a couple hundred or thousands of dollars to get a trademark and to, to, it takes two to do years all this real. Kick in. Yeah. yeah. And it, I was really demoralized because I was like, okay, then like, what does that mean for our ability to, without too much overhead, create new products and, and new businesses? Mm -hmm. And um, then when we went on to sell products, we had a similar thing again, where, decoupling you know the all these buyers want the product the 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 um actually even before just decoupling the business buyers want to know what the PL of the business looks like they want to know but we weren't necessarily keeping separate books for these products and so i've come to learn that you don't need to do everything <laughs> there that there's a there's sort of a sweet spot in the middle where you can create a separate category in your QuickBooks and start creating a, a separate PL around what you're spending on a product 
and that kind of thing. So you can be able to generate those reports and show what you spent on something and that kind of thing. But you don't necessarily need to create an entirely separate entity and start running a whole nother entity and filing separate taxes and, and that kind of thing. But that the trademark is worth it. Um, doing a trademark search, at least with an actual trademark attorney, um, even if you then say it's clear and then don't register the trademark. So at least you get the, the idea that it is clear for, for use and you could register the trademark. Because it wasn't even the same name, right? You were, they were Toad and you were what? Hop Toad. Hop Toad, yeah. Yeah. Um, for the record, I think Air Break's an amazing name. So you did a yeah, good job. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we came up with a we came up with a good replacement name. It just sort of sucked to have to change the name of our existing product with thousands of customers, but we, yeah. you know, we manage. Um, but yeah, so the, I've come to the conclusion that that's worth it. That and and that trademark search, making sure the names you're using are clear. You'll we in the past we spent I think. Five hundred to a thousand dollars to do that with our with our trademark attorney, and then made the decision about whether to file for actual trademark because you you can get a trademark just by using it and proving that that you've used it. And so what we've done then is said for most of the products, what we've done is we've done the trademark search, gotten the sort of thumbs up from the attorney that they would feel comfortable submitting a trademark application and they think that the use is clear, and then. Then we launch the product under that name and we get it going. We show that it has traction and that we are on the road that we want to be on in order to justify spending the extra money and time to fully register for trademarks and that kind of thing. While keeping all the books, not creating a new entity, keeping the entity within our existing company, but start making sure we keep things separate. Even little things like not coupling all of the DNS, not using all the same DNS accounts for registering, not sharing logins between your main consulting business and the product that you're creating for like, you know, your email service or whatever, like set those things up separately. That small amount of overhead makes it so much easier to quickly sell and to make and buy and the buyers at this level a lot of them will offer a quick sale. Mm -hmm. They'll say, Hey, here's my offer. You know, $300,000 will close in 30 days. I'll make it easy for you. That's sort of contingent on you being able to make it easy for them too, right. by being able to transfer over everything, like maybe have everything in a one password vault or a last pass vault that you can just give them access to and know it's logins for everything right there. Right. And so they get that and they give the thumbs up and it goes to the escrow company and you get the, you know, everything cleared. And then some of these products, I think you said you were using internally. Do you, do you mm -hmm. negotiate a lifetime license for you guys or do you clone it or like what happens there? Um, it's been a mix. We've never cloned it. Uh, we, that, that we wouldn't do that. But um, some of them have said like, oh, we'll let you have your account for free for a year or, or um, that kind of thing. I'm sort of smirking to myself because um, a lot of them we're not even customers of anymore. Like we use them for a few years because they had value to us and that kind of thing, but products move on and, yep. and, and that kind of thing. So actually the majority of them, we, we don't even use anymore ourselves. That's very interesting. Dude, yeah. I could talk to you for four hours. I think <laughs> this is very, very interesting because it's so close to things that I've that I've gone through. Like right now, yeah. one, one of the biggest problems I've created this uh, learning software that's optimized for publishing challenges, right? And it's cool. It's interesting. It's called OB. It's I, I love it, but I'm having such a hard time focusing on, and it's so different from everything. Mm -hmm. Plus, also, ninety five percent of the usage is by women, so it's becoming by default, a sort of challenge platform for women with women mm -hmm. coaches and stuff like that. And so I, I'm feeling like I'm just not the person for that job. Uh, I've never thought about going to a broker. It's something I might uh, explore. That could be, uh, that could be an interesting. Idea. In my, in my experience, they've all been willing to have initial conversations and give you and give me honest advice about, eh, we don't think this is ready yet. 
like looking at the actual numbers and that kind of thing and saying, Hey, if you do this instead, give it another six months and make this change or whatever, right. you're going to get a better return. They've, they've been good at providing that kind of advice too. Okay. Very cool. I think that's our time, man. It's uh, I'm trying to be uh, respectful of the time that we have booked for this. Chad, thank you so much for for all that information. I'm sure that it's going to be very useful to any leader of a service business that's been putting, uh, you know, playing around with creating products. It's it's something that we all seem to go through. There, there hasn't been, you know, until you publish your book, there's no uh, there's no clear <laughs> playbook out there for this. So thank you again. Well, um, my pleasure. I hope it was not only helpful for you, but for people listening too. Um, and actually, yes, I haven't written a book yet, but I do have uh, what I call Agency U, which is a sort of combination coaching group um, mentor service for other agency um, people who run agencies. So we do one-on-ones with each other where I help them navigate their business challenges and coach them through challenges or goals. And then we do group meetings um, where people commiserate with each other and help each other and, and that kind of thing as well. So that's very people interesting. Can check that out if they're interested at thoughtbot.com slash agency you. Wait, that's say that, say that slower. You. Oh, thoughtbot.com yep. slash agency, A-G-E-N-C-Y, the letter U. Dot com. Perfect. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Have you. a good one. Cheers. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening to Skunk Works. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.